Good evening and welcome to the Writer's Block. I'm your host, John Ronan, and as you know now, because we are in our 31st consecutive year, I interview writers about their craft, what they're working on, what they've accomplished in the past, what they might be planning for the future. It's a very wide net. We have on poets and other brands of writers, of course, but we also have on sometimes other types of artists. We have had on sculptors, painters, musicians, actors. It's a pretty wide net. So if you have an idea for a guest who might be a good fit for the writer's block, writer or other brand of artist, look for our address at the end of the program. We'd be very happy to get your suggestions. I also want to remind you that the Writer's Block and all the other original programming out of Studio 1623 is a product of cable access television, a valuable community uh, service that you don't get with DISH. So you stick with the Writer's Block, stick with uh, 1623. We do have a guest tonight who is a writer, a poet by the name of Joseph J. Featherstone, and I want to welcome him to the program right now. Good to see you again, Jay. Thanks. Good, great to be here again. You were on the program uh, 10 years ago yes. with an earlier book, Braces Cove, and I want to welcome you back. And in case our uh, video uh, audience has forgotten over those 10 years of your background, I'm going to read the short bio on the back of your new book, Glass. Okay. Uh, Jay Featherstone was born in Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania, schooled in post-war Japan, and was a former editor of the New Republic, headmaster of the Commonwealth School in Boston, and he has studied poetry with Seamus Heaney and Lucy Brock Broido. His first volume of poetry is Braces Cove. He lives in Gloucester near Braces Cove. So welcome again. I was curious how long you spent in Japan before you came home? Uh, I, I lived there nine years, uh, actually, uh, from 1946 to um, nine years later. Uh, I left when I was 17, I think. Uh, so I grew up in Japan, basically. Quite a small. Oh, do you speak yes. any Japanese? Yes, I did. Uh, once upon a time, I was fluent. But now I'm a little rusty. Uh, uh, how that can be. Yes. Now, we're going to show a digital image of your book. I'm going to hold it up as well so that our audience can see it. The lighting is not great here. But yeah. Lift it up a little. The book is Glass. Yes. The poetry is Glass. And it came out this year, 2020. And we're going to, we're going to explore it and uh, Sales should go through the millions after our show yes. uh, airs today. Uh, where did you get the conception for this book? And it's, it's wonderful idea of transparency and barrier simultaneously, which is a, a, a nice theme that you work through the book. Um, well, uh, I don't know. Uh, the essays were written over a 10-year period, at least uh, at least 10 years. Some, some of the poems are older. Uh, so I don't know if I had one conception, but uh, when we came time to put the book together, uh, um, we thought uh, Glass would be a good title. It just seemed to fit uh, everything. And, uh, and uh, we found the wonderful image that you just showed. Uh, the, the artist uh, ag agreed. Actually, the artist, we saw, we saw that image in a gallery uh, and we wrote the artist and I said, how much would it cost to use your wonderful painting? And she said, uh, I don't know, let me see your poems. So I sent her the poems and two weeks later, she wrote back, these are wonderful poems. You can use it for free. Oh, let's plug her. Who's that, <laughs> Who's that artist today? Uh, she is Linda Pocheski, Boston artist. Yeah. Linda Pocheski. Uh, it is a nice image on the. Uh, yeah, yeah. I want to ask you about specific poems. If you want to bring up a poem at any time, please do. 
Okay. I wanted to begin with the title poem, Glass, which is a wonderful uh, moving poem. It's both uh, 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 tragic elements and, and, and uplifting elements at the same time. Can you tell us a little bit about that and then read it for us if you would? Okay. Uh, 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 we had a child named Jody uh, who was born with uh, cerebral palsy uh, and he was blind because of toxoplasmosis, a, a disease that uh, can, can invade a mother uh, when you're pregnant and uh, is actually very common. Um, but we didn't know anything about it. Um, so he grew up very handicapped uh, but he was a radiant child who made friends with everybody uh, and uh, made an indelible impact on lots of people. Uh, when he died, uh, the church was filled with people and we only knew about half of them. Uh, the other half were from his schools and from uh, people who had just fallen in love with him. Um, so he was a special kid. Um, uh, so what, when were his years, uh, Jay? Uh, he was born in uh, uh, six, 78 and died uh, in 86, I think. Uh, so he was, um, yeah. So, uh, do you want me to read uh, all of them or? The five sections? Yeah, five sections. Yes, um, if, you, if you would. Sure, okay, okay. Glass. One, window cleaning. Nights and years of wanting you to be like the others. Morning's colors fetch me a dream. You're a grown up now, a window cleaner, steady on your ladder, legs thick and strong. In short, real life, you were a brain damaged boy in a wheelchair, never a step once danced or a single word uttered, unbroken. Intent now on the work, you wipe the glass and survey the results. Water drips on your massive shoes. The pane of glass between you and me is charged and bright and pure, muting every sound. At last, Jody, you are like the others. Two, clear. A window or is it a door? Clay, sand and pain. I scrub a fire fused layer calling your name. Washed bare, the surface looks etched in places, worn and tinted, lit from behind by present light. I make out the house, the room you shared, transparent, children, grown-ups, sifting together. I can see through you, see through the laugh lines around your mouth in the glass that measures absence. Three, palace. The house is crystal. It is called the house of thanks. From outside, it is a mirror that blinds you. From inside, you gaze out. They say God gives it to you if you were patient when your child dies. The father strides fast toward the half frozen lake and crosses a bridge over air made from echoes. He hunts for copper hair, the kid with hungry, sightless eyes and finds him waiting, sitting in his wheelchair next to the shining house. They greet, touch, the child grins. Together they go for a favorite sound, half song, half obscene noise, a rasp, a lovesick cricket wooing a duck. They crack up, the laughter flies through the useless walls. For astronomy, the child stays far. It might be the game where one hides from others. Conjure up our old house. Mix the blessings, the kitchen lights amber, a glass beehive lit from within. Call again, he may answer, though never in words, a small sound perhaps, like an empty boat. 
Did he ever know his name? Faithful as bread, I read from the children's book. He loved and never grasped. He knew my voice and its rhythms by heart. Little bird, where will you nest? Silence is large. It leaves room for night. He remains quiet, unseen, a star shining by daylight. All I say takes years to travel. Five, air. Imagine a boy freckled and fair, blind, broken, joyful, connoisseur and emperor of farce, lover of fierce noises. He never spoke or kicked a ball or held a fork, but crooned and dined well on the scraps life served. On the last day, he clutched my hands. Wild orderlies in white wheeled the sky away. Now, when a rare ornament slips from fingers or a glass smashes and the black wine spreads, the sound of chaos brings him back. My lolling boy, his hair copper red, laughing because he isn't dead. It's very powerful stuff, Jay. I can tell you on it. There, the, the, the whole uh, is, 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 is very clear, despite the fact there are different different sections. And I'm also struck by some of the uh, some of the lightness, like the lovesick cricket wooing a duck. Yeah. Uh, uh, leavens leavens the, the tone, which is quite serious and profound. Is yeah. that one of the poems that you worked on for a long time and was finished long before the book was published? Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, that uh, yeah, some of those poems even preceded uh, um, versions of it. I, I worked on versions of it uh, for maybe 15 or 20 years, uh, I think. Um, so yeah, it, it's, uh, you know, James Baldwin says, writing is easy. All you have to do is open a vein. Uh, 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 and certainly, if you're writing about family and family, yeah. family uh, tragedy and family gifts, uh, yeah, it's even more so. Yeah. Were the sections here published as separate poems? Uh, no, I don't think any of it was published. Uh, uh, no, I, I held it all together. Uh, I, I wanted it to be together. Oh. Was this, uh, was the idea of this being the title of the book and the title poem uh, present from the beginning? No, no, I had other titles. I can't remember. Uh, I can't remember the other titles, but, but I had a bunch of titles uh, and my editor and I worked through with Glass. Uh, but Glass uh, actually emerged fairly early as a, as a guiding. Uh, because as you said at the beginning, it, it fits not just this poem, but um, others others in the book, uh, the, uh, the transparency and the light. Um, there's something about uh, light and dark that uh, keeps, me, keeps me going as a poet, uh, I guess. Here's a, a tough question. I'm almost a little reluctant to ask it. How difficult how much of an open vein was this to write, especially in the early in the early writing when you were just exploring it? Uh, well, it was hard to write. Uh, that, that's why I had some poems in the first book, uh, The Racist Cove. I had some poems about Jody. Uh, 
but I didn't have a, a full blown elegy or uh, of, of, of grief stricken. Um, the, the grief of it took me years, I think, to get over and, and get through. I, I don't think I'm over it yet. Uh, uh, in fact, I still write, I still wrote a recent poem about Jody. Uh, so he's not out of my system yet. Uh, and I th don't think ever will be. Because you don't, you don't really overcome grief. You just uh, live with it, uh, it seems to me. Yes. Poetry has to help living with it, however. Huh? Yeah, it does. It does. How to, how to keep yes. with reality. Yes, yeah, saying it, uh, saying it, it's, it's like the blues. It's a version of the blues uh, in music. You, you, you sing the song and you feel better. Yeah. I compliment you on that poem. It's a wonderful poem. It's very powerful. And I, uh, uh, I got, I, 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 ju I jumped to it first because I wanted to read the book's title poem. And it <laughs> certainly uh, impressed and I could see immediately why and how it was uh, appropriate to, to be the title poem. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a couple of poems marked. I want to ask you about, the, but before that, uh, I want to ask you if you would like to read something from Brace's Cove, and also if you have any poems you'd like to highlight from your new book, Glass. Um, yeah, I, I have a, uh, well, why don't we go with um, some, some of the new poems uh, from, Glass, I, glass. I'd like to read one part of one poem, actually, which is very instructive. I think about uh, some of my sources. Uh, uh, there's a a poem in which uh, I assume the persona of uh, F. H. Lane, uh, the famous Gloucester painter, uh, the uh, who, who did the a famous series of paintings of Brace's Cove, uh, which haunts me as a place. Uh, it's, a, it's a beautiful, beautiful cove uh, north of Gloucester Harbor. Uh, and it's a numinous place. I feel like it's a sacred, sacred ground uh, somehow. Um, and Lane felt that way clearly because he did this wonderful series of oil paintings toward the end of his life. He was very sick, probably knew he was dying. Uh, and he did five different paintings of Brace's Cove, Brace's Rock uh, in the foreground. Uh, and uh, they're, they're wonderful paintings. They're very small. I was startled uh, when I first saw them because they were, they look like postage stamp almost. Uh, they're, they're tiny things. Uh, but they're, they reward effort. And you can go to the Cape Ann website and it has uh, illustration, it has versions of all five of them on the website. Uh, the, paint, the museum only has one permanent copy of, of the series, but the but this series was, was wonderful. And, and uh, Lane became a touchstone for me. Um, and he, he, there was sort of a Japanese element in my love of him, because he seems to me an American version of Zen, uh, where, where everything is ha empty and full at the same time. It's a, and, and I try to, in my poems to emulate Lane in that, and, and the Zen Japanese ethic of empty and full at the same time. So, uh, so this is part of the poem uh, that I write in, in Lane's voice, Lane's voice. Um, the five paintings of Brace's Cove came late and hard. A boy drove me out to Eastern Point on a donkey cart. Crutches were the devil on the stones. That wild rocky cove with its sublime curve of beach serves as my refuge. In town, locked down by winter storms, I memorized leaves and flowers, peerless light of summer's end. I was never a man for churches. Let the cove and its great sleeping rock 
be my icons. In the spell of washing tides, late and early sun, the facts began to dream, rocking to the pulse of the world. Pink and red granite, black rockweed, asters, frozen sunlight sounds an organ chord. Fragments, I was like a boy playing on a beach, building small salt cathedrals. In the foreground, the dark body of a fishing boat disintegrates. I must tell you by then, I was ebbing, sick in body, in despair of the war, the future of the Republic. He was writing during the Civil War. The dying must learn a requiem based on silences as well as notes. I may be less in the future than I am now. I swam the tides as well as my body allowed. Say that the cove was my farthest shore. I felt suspended there, transparent, glad to the brink of fear. I haven't been to Braces Cove in, Braces Cove in some time. I'll have to go over again. Oh, take it in, take it in. I will. And I'll have to visit the uh, KPM Museum website to look at the uh, one. Yeah, yeah. I urge all your readers, all your hearers, all the audience to, to do so. Uh, I especially want to compliment you on the line. Uh, I may be less in the future than I am now. Yes. Wonderful, wonderful line. I want to ask you about a poem in here, if I may, because uh, there's a couple that refer to primitive men or primitive man or the Ice Age. And mm -hmm. the first of them is titled The Age of Ice. Yes. Which appears yes. in Gloucester in an anthology. Yes. Uh, edited by you. Yes, it was. <laughs> right. Uh, I, had, I had very good taste. <laughs> yes. Uh, I wonder if you could discuss that poem. And uh, you mentioned uh, in an American Indian context, uh, prehistory as well, uh, and your, your seeming attraction to uh, the ancient past, our deep, deep history. Yes. Shall I read the poem? Yes, would you please? Okay. 51. 51, yeah. The age of ice. No snow or wind to mar the shining facts of daylight or last night's salt of stars. The pond snap frozen yesterday, smooth but for the glacial seams that groan and shove like mastodons. Clear shallow bottom flies by, a lily in amber ice, tuft of frozen thistle down, bearing seeds. Sun, ice, buried flower, alchemize into sound, a beehive in thoughts shallow, knock, knock, knock of apple, drum and twang of summer frogs. My breath catches at muscled brightness underfoot, a pickerel flashes past in serene light. The ancient principle of ice is maintained by green leaves and fossils and 10,000 seasons of polish. Measured depths and daily risks instruct a catechism of cold and melt. The halos glaring off the sun's icons are proof of my cataracts, young and growing. At the blurring sight, some old edge divides in me and tells me I will die. My motion descends, calling blue and bluer and bluest to sky and brightest to sun, yes to the wild whipping surf. I scrape quick on borrowed skates, as wick as any firm or muskrat or ear of corn. Trying my shaky figure eight, I meet face housed in fur, the ancestor who takes charcoal and on the cave's rough wall draws a mare in full. Very nicely done. I like the use of ice there. The ice is a is a glass itself. 
Yes. Which you can, or maybe a crystal ball too, in which you can see this uh, this uh, early uh, early person making. Yes. Cave art. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I was stunned when I first. Um, there was an exhibit in Boston uh, of cave art in the seventies, early seventies. They 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 took uh, pictures of it and you know, it wasn't the actual cave art, uh, but I was, blown, I was blown away by it uh, and studied Lascaux and uh, those, those famous cave paintings. Uh, and they've always struck me as, as wonderful. The, fa the, 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 uh, the mare in foal at the end is a, is a, is a famous cave art uh, representation. Um, and uh, it just struck me as uh, as as universal art that that's just um, it's just there. I mean, it, it, it's not no sign of progress or uh, there's no getting around the fact that 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 art is great art um, and. We haven't improved any uh, since no. then. No. I agree. I agree. Extremely, extremely powerful. Yeah, yeah. So that that was that. We're getting very close to our time already. I want to. Oh. I want to ask you a, a technical question, uh, not a technical question, but a. Uh, uh, a workplace sort of question. What advice would you give to young poets who are dedicated to their craft, but realize they're in an age when poetry is not exactly on a pedestal? Well, you need a day job uh, uh, is the first thing. Uh, you can't make a living on poetry. Uh, I've, I've always uh, done other things like uh, run a teacher education program uh, or be a journalist uh, or um, uh, uh, be a professor at a college. Uh, you, you, you can piece together an existence that way. And if you're lucky and you have summers off, you can write poetry uh, that way. Um, but, you, but you do need a day job. The other, the other advice I have is just is just to read a lot of poetry. We'll read a lot, period. Yes. Uh, that, that the more you read, the better you, you are, I think. I've mentioned that to the students over the years. They said they want to write and I say, read. They said, yes. no, no I, I didn't say that, read. I said, I want to write. I said, I heard you. I yes. Heard you. yes, yes. Um, but it's really true, uh, reading. Reading is the key, I think. Uh, a follow-up question, Jay. Uh, uh, can you name two or three of your favorite go-to poets? Uh, well, because I was taught by them, uh, Seamus Heaney mm -hmm. is a go-to poet, uh, and Lucy Brock Broido. Uh, Lucy, uh, Lucy had a writing group that met in Boston in the summers for 30 years, like, I'm not kidding you. It went on and on and on. It would always have new, new young members, but it had old lags like me uh, in it. Uh, and it was the most wonderful circle of people. I mean, it was just, uh, she taught us so much. Um, and she, uh, she was really uh, my inspiration. There's a poem in the, book about Lucy, uh, yes. uh, uh, as there is about Seamus too. Uh, but but uh, I was very lucky to be a part of a poetry group at Harvard uh, where, she, where Seamus came and he was then not famous. He was not famous Seamus uh, as he became later. Uh, he was just another Irish poet. Uh, uh, and uh, he, 
and I hit it off. Uh, and we used to go to, after the class, after the workshop, we would go to a pub together to debrief. Uh, and that was an education in itself. Uh, I just learned so much from him. That's a good, good piece of personal history there. I appreciate yes. it. Yes. With us. I want to thank you. I'm watching my clock. I'm embarrassed, but it's already time. I'm watching the clock and I regret that I can't get to all the poetry in the book. But I do want to thank you, uh, Jay Featherstone, for being with us this evening on the writer's block and sharing the poetry and the, uh, and the ambiance of poetry uh, with us this evening. Thank you. Thank you. I want to thank everybody in our TV audience, too, for being with us. If you've learned something about poetry and the roots and the emotional sources of poetry from Jay Featherstone tonight, then the writer's block has done its job. I hope to see you again next week on the writer's block. Good night. Thank you.